pregunta es, al, al principio, al, al comenzamiento de la presentación, ha hablado de una época de cambios en el survey de probation y de una cierta privatización. ¿Podría explicar una mica més en qué va a consistir? Sí. Yes. Um... This, um, well, in 2010, we had a general election in Britain where um, a, a conservative government was elected. The conservative politicians in Britain have always been interested in taking services out of the public sector and instead having them provided by commercial organizations and paying them to do it um, for two reasons. One is they think this is cheaper. The other is that they think profit-making organizations have a greater incentive to improve what they're doing. Um, this also means that conservative politicians who want to impress their colleagues, if they become ministers in charge of a department, they try to introduce privatization schemes um, to, um, well, because I think it will be good for their political careers. And we had a very clear example of that with probation. 70% of the work of the probation service was handed over to private providers two years ago. Um, in uh, th There was a bidding process, there was a competition, but um, very few private providers were involved. So in many cases, um, if you bid for a particular area, it was divided up into geographical areas. Different companies bid for different areas. Mostly they got what they bid for because there wasn't much competition. And the most surprising part was that the probation service itself, which is the most experienced organization in delivering these services, was not allowed to bid because what the politician intended to achieve was the privatization. Um, and this would, would impress his colleagues. So it wasn't really about results. It wasn't really about improvement. It was about a political gesture from a politician who had ambitions to rise <coughs> further up. Um, and because this is being recorded, I'll give you his name, which is Chris Grayling. Um, and uh, interestingly, he didn't keep that job, um, but instead he went on to be one of the politicians campaigning for Brexit. And uh, he is now back in the government again as Minister of Transport. He's now in charge of developing the high-speed trains and other things. Um, what have been the consequences of privatization? Well, first of all, of course, there was major disruption, um, not just for the 70% of staff who ended up in the private companies, but also for the 30% who stayed with the publicly provided probation service because that in itself has been reorganized. It's now run as one national probation service from London. It has less relationship with sentencers and courts and judges than it used to have. Um, and where we have been able to see anything about the quality of practice since these changes, um, our probation inspectors have now produced some reports which show that in most of the areas they've looked at where they've been able to compare the two, the work done by the new community rehabilitation companies is inferior to the work done by the National Probation Service or by the previous probation service because, of course, they inspected that as well so they can compare over time. Um, and there are financial problems for these companies. They expected a certain level of income and profit and they haven't been able to achieve this because not enough orders are being made by the courts. Um, 
I think this is because the courts do not have much com much confidence in those companies. Um, and so their income is going down. And how are they dealing with this? They're dealing with it by planning to make about one third of their staff redundant. So they will not be able to maintain the kind of quality of supervision that I've been talking about in most cases. Now, to be fair, there is one exception. Um, in the county of Kent in England, the, the difference is the other way. The community relations, the community rehabilitation company is actually doing better than the probation service. Um, that's a staffing issue. The probation service there is very short of staff, and so they can't maintain um, sensible caseloads. The caseloads are kind of up in the 70s instead of down in the 30s where they should be. But um, in general, all the evidence so far is that the privatization has been a disaster as far as quality of service is concerned and a disaster as far as public safety is concerned. Um, the government is now reviewing it. Um, we, had, we had a change of minister. Um, a man called Michael Gove came in to replace Mr. Grayling and immediately changed a lot of the things that his predecessor had done. But Michael Gove is now out of a job too because of Brexit, because he was one of the people that campaigned for that and was so obviously horrible that they couldn't give him a job in the new government. Um, and um, so, um, so things have slowed down there. We have a new Minister of Justice who is very inexperienced, still learning what to do, but they have announced that they will review the arrangements because they seem to be unworkable. Um, so all the evidence suggests that privatization is not the magic bullet to produce a better service. Right? It would appear to be largely the reverse. I thought we already knew that from our train services, but um, apparently we don't learn the lessons, or not as quickly as we should. That's a very long answer to your question, but I hope it's a, a clear one. Any more questions? Una cosa més a afegir. Bé, doncs, sí? Sílvia, doncs. Trobo molt interessant el fet que enfoquéssiu el que és l'anàlisi de l'impacte, de com actuen els professionals i de les habilitats que posen en joc els professionals en el que és la reincidència. Com es van prendre això els professionals, el fet que fossin avaluades les seves habilitats directament i quin impacte ha tingut en el vostre sistema el fet que els professionals siguin avaluats? Very good question. Part of the answer to the question is you have to think about why did I do this in Jersey, a small Channel Island. Um, and part of the reason for that is that it's a very stable community there. It's a small place. It's a small probation service. Um, and they were less frightened of evaluation than, um, than some other people are. <coughs> Uh, it's because it's small, I can get all of them into one small room and explain it to them. Um, even so, some of them didn't want to do it, and they were allowed not to do it. Um, the identity of the officers in the, the database that analyzes the results and the reconvictions is disguised. Um, it's, there's an encrypted list somewhere else that only certain people have access to and so on. Um, the management of the service do not have access to, to that list. They don't have access to the individual scores. Um, if I ask them, 
which are your best officers and which are the ones that you most think you need to do something about. They will come up with the same list that I have in my research, but, um, but they don't have access to the data. Um, at one point, the study nearly didn't happen because the chief probation officer um, said everyone would have to do it. Right? And so those ones who were doing it all stopped and I had to persuade them to start again and we had to write a new set of rules about um, consent, confidentiality, all the rest of it. And that was in a place where um, the officers have quite a good understanding of research and quite a long history of it being involved in it because we've been doing research on what works there since 1996. And um, in England and Wales at the moment, officers are so frightened about their futures and so worried about the way things are training are changing that it will be difficult to get them to participate in a study of this kind. Being videotaped is not something new. Um, I, I was videotaping uh, group sessions in Wales in the early 1990s, but individual sessions have not been videotaped very much in, um, in England and Wales. There's also been a resistance to scoring. People don't like being given marks, so to speak. Um, so all of these things meant that I don't think it would have been possible to get a study like this off the ground in England and Wales at the moment. Um, you need to do it in a place which is reasonably stable, where people aren't frightened, where there is a, a positive support from the organization, um, where people have good access to training, things like that. Um, and then people can take the risk of finding out. Um, I, I, I've done this. I've, um, I've videotaped interviews and watched myself, and it's horrible, right? And um, any of you who've done it probably have the same experience. It, it's uh, partly because you find out what you're doing wrong, and you think you've corrected it, and then when you see it again, you find you're still doing it. Um, and it, it, it takes longer to, to shift a habit. Um, some of the officers that I have on tape are far more skilled than I ever was. Um, it's um, uh, it's not, not because of being skillful that I got interested in skills, it's because of, of wanting to know how they worked. You know. um, so the answer to your question is, um, yes, they were anxious, yes, they were concerned, but they were also prepared to do it because they were in a reasonably secure situation and we set it up in a way that allowed them to feel safe. Um, and now they're doing it to each other. So they're not reliant on the assessments that I and my colleagues made. Two colleagues in particular, Morris Vanston and Pamela Ogwadiki, worked with me on all these interviews. Um, and the, the officers do not have um, those scores. They can ask for them if they want, but, um, uh, but on the whole they haven't. They've preferred to go through a similar process themselves with each other, um, which I think is better. I think it's good. I did have, I had two officers um, ask me for individual feedback on the assessment of their interviews. That's out of the 14 who, who took part in the study. Um, so, it's difficult but not impossible for people to get involved in this kind of thing. And from the way that they've taken it up and continue, continued it themselves, um, you can see that it has a kind of payoff for them as well as just for research. It wouldn't be that much use if it only resulted in research papers. It's, it's useful if it results in improved practice and better outcomes for people who are dependent on these services to try and put their lives together. Again, that's a long answer, but I hope it's a thorough answer, right? Um, now, I, th I think there's two minutes left. Yes. Is there any question any that I can answer in only two minutes, I wonder? Pregunta, no sé si per una resposta. Tenim temps per una pregunta, dic no sé si per una resposta. 
we have time for a question, but I don't know if I for an answer. <laughs> It would need to be a really simple question. <laughs> uh, thank you.